you know, and and also as a as an author, you can take those one star reviews and turn them into advertising gold. You know, a, a friend of mine, uh, Rachel Renner, a lovely lovely woman, writes amazing urban fantasies. Um, I, I I love her books. Um, and it, it, it's fortunate that she and I get along so well because you know, turned into pretty good friends. But she got a one-star review, uh, and she turned it around, and it is, and turned it into an ad because it, it was just it was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant what she did. You know, it, it was highlighting. And I don't want to give too much away about the book, it, but it was highlighting something that was in the book that this person didn't like, which most people probably would. So, okay, you know, go see what all the fuss is about. Hey everyone, welcome back to Living the Next Chapter. I have an author on with an amazing background, by the way. You can definitely have to check this out. Uh, so great to have Adam on the podcast, and he's so kind. Sent me a copy of his, of one of his books. There's many, many things that he's doing. Holding it in my hand. And my wife and I are going to be fighting over it. But I'm holding in my hand Adam Gaffin's book, uh, Into the Black Tales from the Cassidy Verse 1. Right? And then here it is in my hand. Awesome. Adam, welcome to the podcast. Glad to have you here. Yeah, glad to be here. Glad, glad, the, uh, glad the book arrived. Yes, it's very kind of you to send that. And what I like to do for all my authors that do send me a book... Um, is I take it down to Niagara Falls and I take some pictures of your book at the falls. So your book has arrived in at Niagara Falls. <laughs> so I'll send you some pictures of your book. In as place. long as it doesn't go over the falls. No, no, be- don't, don't do that. No. no, no, I love it. Thank you for sending it. So kind of you. I appreciate that. Um, Adam, tell everybody where you are in this big world of ours. Sure. So I live in uh, Southern Colorado these days, um, about as close to the New Mexico border as you can possibly get. Uh, without actually being in New Mexico, and um, yeah, it, it's a it's a lovely little town we live in. I live here with my wife, and we've got five dogs and five cats. And I s- sit around wondering where all the time goes. <laughs> that's a that's a, a zoo. That's great. I love that you have that. That's Quite a, a menagerie. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and they're with some of them are with you as we're recording. So if you hear a familiar sound. <laughs> that's uh that's a studio audience today, which I'm so happy to have them a part of this as well. It's great. Um, Adam, take us back a little bit. You have a lot of books in your library that you've written. Continue to write, you continue to keep creating all the time. Take us back to the beginning. I always like to ask this of my guests. There was a point in time when you weren't an author. It wasn't really on your plate at the moment, but now you are and you're doing a lot. Take us back to the beginning. What was that beginning spark for you as an author that you you said, I, A, I can do this, and B, this is something that I'm passionate about? Take us back to that point. Right. So I, th- there have been – I look at it as this is kind of the third phase of my author career that I'm in right now. Uh, the first time kind of sputtered out, oh, in the early 90s. That, you know, had had some ideas, wrote out this massive uh, future history, a very Heinlein-esque future history, covered a couple hundred years, pulled some stories out of that, uh, pulled a, a, a vampire and time travel mashup, uh, which actually is still in print. It's my wife's favorite story of everything I've ever written. Uh, she, she would pick the one that's 30 years old this year. Um, <laughs> And and then it died away for probably 20 years or so. Um, the first glimmerings of the Cassidy verse started in 2012 with I just I just had this scene in my head and it was a wedding and um, and and the participants get up in front of the minister and the minister pulls out a gun and tries to kill the bride. Uh, and, and naturally they take off running and I had to know what happened next. So I started writing. Then I got a couple of novellas out, felt really good about it, had a plan for two more. And then life intervened again. 
<laughs> and then finally, finally, um, you know, the, the, the old saying, it's an ill wind that blows no good um, with when the pandemic shut everything down. You know, at the time, uh, my my previous job had been downsized and I was, you know, just filling my days with this and that. And it occurred to me, well, I, you know, I can pick this up and, you know, see you know, see if I can finish it off. And suddenly I knew how the story was going to end. So I, I finished it and that became the first Cassidy Chronicles book. And it hasn't stopped since. Wow. Okay. So you got to take us to Cassidy verse. Come on, like explain, explain this new world to us who have not heard of this yet. Tell us about the world and like, give us some time frames. give us some general background to Cassidy verse. Sure. So it is, it is hope punk near future science fiction, which means it takes place about a hundred years in the future. And it looks at the future with just a little bit of optimism. It doesn't say everything is going to be good or perfect. I mean, there are too many, there are too many of those shows and TV, you know, you know, those shows and movies and books out there anyways, which say, Ooh, look, it's all going to be a utopia. No, it's not because humans are always going to be humans. Right. Um, But there are also way too many books and media out there which say the future is going to be terrible and the best you can hope for is to survive, you know, and carve out your tiny little space for yourself where, you know, you can go about your business. Um, You know, the dystopian and the grimdark stories. Hope Punk looks for middle ground. Again, it doesn't say everything's going to be perfect. But it does say that no matter how bad things get, you don't stop trying to make things better. And not just for yourself. And that's where it's different from the dystopian. Um, You're not just out for yourself. You're actually out, you know, you're looking out for the best interests of the people around you and your community. Um, And so how that pulls into into the Cassidy Chronicles and the Cassidy verse is after the origin story, which is the first book, the Cassidy Chronicles, uh, Kendra and her wife get into the business of space exploration and they're building a faster than light starship. Um, It's going to be the first of its kind. And that's a wonderful thing. Get out, explore the stars. I mean, it's what Kendra wants to do. Problem with that is not everybody is as enthusiastic about faster than light um, exploration as she is, specifically the Solarian Union, which are the former colonies out in the solar system. They broke away. They hold the high ground. They hold all the power in the solar system because they have the high ground. If Earth has a starship that can just go off to some other solar system and come back with a cargo hold full of rare earth metals and, you know, anything else that humanity needs and bring humanity to other stars. Well, all the Solarian Union power goes away. Hmm. So they, they're going to do everything they possibly can to stop Kendra's dream from coming true. Problem. Kendra doesn't like t- being told no. She, she's she's never dealt well with it. Hmm. Uh, so th- that starts off the, the four book Artemis War series. So tell me more about Kendra as a main character, a little deeper into who she is and maybe some of the people that surround her that kind of we kind of get introduced to early on. She's all right. She's had a bit of a background. She grew, she and Ayana grew up together in the Northern Imperium, which um, is the current states of Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, and Illinois. She grows up very small town. She and Ayana live next door. They are best friends from toddlerhood. You know, and they, they separate after high school. Kendra goes off to California because she wants to be an actress, starts her own production company, 
does pretty well, she thinks, until she realizes that uh, she's in way over her head. She gets bailed out by a company that actually is recruiting her to become a courier and not just, you know, not just, you know, UPS or FedEx, but for packages that absolutely positively have to get through, no, you know, no, um, no obstacle is too big, you know, Mm -hmm. kind of a a, a Jane Bond-esque, except, you know, her whole mission is delivering the package. Um, And that morphs into her learning how to be an assassin. She, like I said, she has, she has an interesting background before she and Ayana reunite. Uh, They're both in their early thirties. That's the Cassidy Chronicles. And then, one of the things I did with these characters is that they're not kids. They're not young when these books are happening. Uh, in the Artemis War, you know, the, you know, by the end of the Artemis War, you know, uh, Kendra and Iana have both turned 40. You know, so they're, they're adult and they realize the, the responsibilities that come with it. But she picks up, she has this dream, you know, it, this, this dream of getting out into space. And she picks up people around her who want to share in that dream and who believe in the dream and so believe in her. Nice. Nice. Okay, so I have to ask, where, as a, as a non-author listening to you, go through all the details that you have around your characters and places and times and this equals this, and this is that. And I'm I'm listening to you going, okay, I have a hard time remembering everything on my grocery list. I How how does somebody, I know it takes a long time. It doesn't just happen overnight. But how do you keep all of this straight? How do you build out a world in such detail? I am, I am exhausted listening because I'm, this is so amazing that you can build all this in your brain and pull all these things together that have to be there to support each other. Where does this come from for you? So I, a lot of it comes from every author, I believe, starts as a reader. And we are constantly devouring more and more books and especially people who write in science fiction and fantasy we always look at whatever is going on with the question what if burning in the back of our head it doesn't matter if it's looking at groceries or you know looking at the latest uh, latest advancement in AI or quantum computing. You know, we are always looking at it going, what if? So we're, we're building from there. And even other authors, you know, we're going, okay, that was, a, that was a good story. I enjoyed that story. But at the beginning, what if this character had done this other thing? If they had gone down path B instead of path A? Now, how would that change this whole world? You know, that, um, who was it? Uh, who, who wrote the Twilight books? Um, Stephanie Meyer, I think. I think so, yeah. You know, those were, she read, no, sorry, it was E.L. Gray who wrote the Fifty Shades, right? Who wrote Fifty Shades. That was a fan fiction based on the Twilight books. It was, it was, it was, she looked at something in the Twilight books and said, well, what if, and she took that personal, that personal relationship and turned it into a, a, a three, you know, into a trilogy. Yeah. Um, you know, it's amazing where authors, you know, will get their ideas. And so now as for keeping it all straight, <laughs> um, there's a reason my books have appendices with lists of characters and there's a reason that my chapter headings have uh, the dates and locations. Uh, It's so that it helps keep me straight. Uh, Let's see if if you're looking into the black, the the only one in there is 
Uh, if the Martian Gambit is in there, there's a cast of characters in there because that was a 15,000 word story. Uh, recruiting Kendra is a big one, but it's mostly Kendra and it's written from her perspective. When I'm writing from first person, it's a lot easier to keep things straight because all I know as the author is what the character knows. Right. You know, because if I'm writing, I did this and I did that, then I don't know what's going on half a continent away. True. Right. So, so you're kind of dancing between the character's development and the story's development, how the character fits into the bigger picture and how the bigger picture fits into the character at the same time. It, yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the fun things to do is you have these vibrant characters and you drop them into a situation. You know, you come up with the what if situation and then just see how they react. You know, the, the characters, the characters tell you how the story is going to go. When, when I was finished with the Cassidy Chronicles, I thought I was done with Kendra and Iona Cassidy. I thought I had told their story and I was moving on to something else. And I thought I had a good plot. And I got about 5,000 words into it. And the world building wasn't there. It wasn't ringing true. It didn't feel right. Um, and Kendra kind of popped into my head and said, duh, I'm not in it. You know, this, this is actually happening in my world. So if you put this, you know, put this into my world and it's all going to make sense. And, and, and it did. And it did. So, again, that was the, the character saying, hello, pay attention to me. You know, you, you got to listen to those voices. Hmm. All right. So for a young author, early days, looking at writing in a style in a way that you do, what are some early basic 101 things that you would have loved to hear as, an, as a young author that maybe we can share with somebody listening to kind of help them shape character development, world building, all of that stuff? Yeah. What, what do you uh, got? So first of all, don't ever stop writing. Uh, I've done that twice, and it's really hard to get back into. So even if you know, even if you're you're writing ten words a day, even if you're just jotting down some ideas, or you know, uh, something that a lot of authors do, I've I've seen are mood boards. You know, they create these mood boards with. You know, the, the emotions I want to evoke uh, in their stories. You know, even if you're just doing something like that, you know, staying connected to those worlds that you're building is a lot easier than trying to get back into the world that you're building. So that's the first thing. Don't stop writing. And the second thing is don't be afraid of writing crap uh, mm -hmm. because you're going to. Uh, mm -hmm. The ideas do not come out fully formed. Uh, they they need they need time. They need effort. They need retooling. So when you have produced that first draft of the story and it's five thousand words long, and you're looking at it and going, "Why did I write this? <laughs> it's terrible." <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't panic. You can only edit the words that you have written. You can only change the words that you've written. If you don't write them, you can't change them. So write them down. When you finish it, put it aside. Don't go right back into it. You know, um, get, get a little bit of distance between you and the story. And then, you know, work on some other project because... There are always other projects that you can work on. Yeah. And then come back to it, you know, and, and, and make those tweaks and make those fixes. Um, and, and have fun with it. Look, if you're not writing a story that you enjoy, why are you writing it? Yeah. You know, if you're, I, I know, I know there's the whole right to market kind of thing. <sighs> that seems awfully cynical to me. You know, that, that's, the, that's the least common denominator kind of writing. 
you know, I, I'm, I'm going to write this because right now it's hot and I can, I can get out a 50,000 word book in 30 days and I'm going to put it out there and hope that I catch some of this wave so I can make a little extra money. But if you, if you don't like the book, if you don't like the characters, if you don't like the plot, why are you doing it? Yeah. Write the stuff you want to read. Because it's going to show when someone picks up your book and starts reading, if it feels forced or manufactured, right, with no heart, no love, no passion, mm -hmm. it's going to come through in the words. People are going to catch it and go, I'm not, feel, I'm not connecting with the characters. I'm not connecting with the story. There's something missing. And it's, it's the, the heart and passion of the author to be showing up in, in the pages. Yeah. I, and, and don't be afraid to put something aside for a while. You know, and work on other projects. You know, I have a I have a fantasy trilogy that's coming out, and you know, it's two hundred and I don't know about two hundred twenty thousand words between the three books, and you know that occupied most of my time for the best part of a year. In the meantime, the sequel to the Ghosts of Tantor, which I've been promising my readers for a year and a half now, um, you know, has kind of languished because I wasn't in that world. I, I wasn't, I wasn't connected to it. I wasn't feeling those characters. You know, these other characters were saying, Hey, you need to write our story first. You, 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 hello. You know, and, and when a character starts yelling, you, you need to listen uh, because if you don't, they go away and, you don't want that to happen. You want those characters captured and put on the page. Um, but now that, like I said, that trilogy is coming out. It's all done. It's edited. It's formatted. It's, it's, it's all lined up. So now I'm getting back into tracking Tantor and I, I, I see where, where it's going to end. I, I finally have the clear vision. Okay, this is how I'm going to wrap up this book. And so now that I have that again, now that I'm into the characters again, it's coming a lot easier. And now I can look at it and say, yeah, this is going to get done. So, yeah. Yeah. It, it's about the passion. Yeah. Not feeling it. Don't force it. So, as an author, too, like, has there been moments with all of the books you've been writing and all the things you've been doing? Has there been a moment as an author where you took a path that you found you you come to regret? You're like, this was the wrong path for me, whether it be around what you're writing or how you're writing, who you are as an author. Was there ever a part where you like started backtracking and went, I kind of lost my way here and I'm gonna refocus and get back to where I should be? And if there was, how did how did you get from possibly what I would call maybe a mistake or a misstep? How did you get back on, on path again? The first step is realizing that you're on it. Um, and realizing that it's, it's not a path that's taking you to a place that you want to go. Right. Um, and, and sometimes you don't know that until it's almost on top of you. You know, it, until that destination is in sight and you're going, Oh, hmm. Oh, that's, no, that's, that's, a, that, no. Um, so, so you backtrack and, and you, and you go back to the, the last point where it feels true to you, you know, and, and, and then you, okay, I'm going to go this other path now. Um, and maybe there are parts of what you wrote that can carry over from one path to the other. You know, because uh, you, you take a character and you change a couple of details about them and maybe they fit better into a different universe, you know, a different role in the universe. Okay. You know, you take what you can and you move on. Um, and, and the stuff that doesn't work, and that doesn't mean delete it. That doesn't mean throw the file away. Uh it just means it's not working for you right now. So you put it aside, you know, it, okay. I, I, I said, I said before, humans are going to human, you know, that being said, 
we are flawed individuals. Every single one of us, we are all going to make mistakes and, you know, recognizing it and learning from it and correcting it is part of being human. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier about, you know, authors being readers as a reader yourself, you mentioned to me when we met originally, there was a few authors that you really stood out to you that kind of helped shape maybe what you, where you ended up today. Talk a little bit about some of those authors that kind of added some of their secret spices to who you are <laughs> as an author. Secret spices. So, I mean, Robert Heinlein is at the top of my list for favorite authors. I mean, I, I think I think I have every single one of his books and stories, um, including his nonfiction, uh, which there's not a lot of. Um, and I think I have every single one of his books in one form or another. And that's the only author I can say that about. Douglas Adams comes close. Douglas Adams and the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and his, mm. his humorous view of the universe. Um, but Heinlein injected so much of himself into his books. And he, one of his books that it was a weird introduction to Heinlein. And this is in the 80s and I'm in high school. I read The Cat Who Walks Through Walls, and it was one of his later books. And one of the main characters in there is a writer. And so here's Heinlein writing through the perspective of this writer, and he's talking about the art of writing. Mm. So he's really reaching out to not just fans, but to other authors who are reading him and saying, this is what I do. This is how I do it. And again, injecting a lot of himself into it. Um, so Heinlein, Douglas Adams. And as a reader, you know, I just, I take so much in as I'm reading. Um, yeah, the, the 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 fantasy novels that are coming out, you know, I I know that they owe, you know, that they're influenced up here by uh, Good Omens, you know, Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett, brilliant, brilliant book. I first I read that when it first came out, and I think I've worn out a couple of copies. I've given away more copies than I can remember. Um, you know, Kim Harrison, who's a current urban fantasy author um there are some you know there are some stylistic things that she does um elliot k again all of these authors we all build on each other yeah so you know and, and we learn from each other you know when we're at conventions we're talking craft with each other and talking about you know this that and the other thing and and that's all going to percolate, you know, and something that I said to, you know, that I said to an author two years ago, you know, might percolate and come up in something that they write next year. And that's great. You know, we're, we're all feeding each other. What does that mean to you, Adam, if somebody reaches out to you and says what you've said about these authors and how you look up to them, what would it mean to you to have somebody reach out to you and say the same of you, Adam, your books and how you do what you do has been my foundation where I'm building my career as a writer. Thanks to you, I am now on this path. What does that mean to an author to hear from another author that you've inspired? So you may have heard of this, you know, paying it forward. This is a Heinlein thing. He talked about it in his books in the 40s and 50s. Um, and so having another author come to me and say, hey, you know, you really inspired me to do this, that, or the other. You know, that means that I've paid it forward. You know, I, I, I took what Heinlein gave me, and I took what Adam, you know, Douglas Adams gave me, and, it, you know, everybody else who has contributed to 
what's going on up here. And I've paid that forward to somebody else. So, I mean, that's, that's incredibly, um, you know, it, it incredibly satisfying. It, 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 it's like, so I have, um, I have books out that are in the hands of uh, advanced readers, okay? The, the people who get copies ahead of time so that they can read it and leave reviews so that, you know, it, it spurs sales, right? You know, get the, get the early word out there. I had one woman, she picked up the first book of this new trilogy. She read it in a few days. Picked up the second book, read that in a couple of days. Picked up the third book, read it literally overnight. And then her post, you know, her post and her review on that one was, okay, I love these characters and now I have a book hangover. And I'm just sitting there going, oh, ooh. <laughs> yeah. What a great problem to have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When, when, when the reader ends the series and they're like, yes, I want more of these characters. Okay, I did something right. I wrote characters that people want, you know, that people can relate to. Yeah, I love it. So, yeah, like I said at the beginning, you graciously sent me a copy of Into the Black. Tell me more about Into the Black specifically, as I'm holding it here on camera. Um, tell me more about this and what was the, what's the big picture idea for this for someone who's going to buy this book and grab a copy and leave a good review, by the way. Um, what is the big picture that you want to share to the reader as they jump into Into the Black? So Into the Black gives you the side stories, the background stories, the things that are going on that are important but don't really fit into the flow. If you think of, if you think of a series of novels like the Avengers movies, you know, with this big cast of characters, and they'll drop like a line in there that refers to something that happened off screen. Right. Yeah. And, and it makes sense to the characters who are talking, but it doesn't really make a lot of sense to the viewer, but it, it gives the character some depth. Well, those are whole stories. So with into the black, I wrote out a bunch of those stories. So these are like the, the MCU TV shows, you know, which, which show you the things that are going on off screen. Um, recruiting Kendra, you know, that's her story when she is being recruited to be a courier, you know, from being an actress. Um, there's, there's a political thriller in there, a uh, piece of the action, which is the story of how the Terran Federation's great charter you know, gets voted into, you know, it's a final vote on whether or not they're going to accept this great charter and, you know, really take the, the, the job of building a nation seriously. Um, and there are fun stories in there as well. There's a, um, there's a, there's a take on a, the Medusa myth, uh, hell hath no fury. Okay. Um, there are a lot of Medusa references in there, uh, which take a little bit of digging. Uh, I, I love doing that. I love uh, I love leaving Easter eggs that aren't quite obvious. <laughs> one of my favorite stories in there is Murder on the Missouri. I took my I took a swing at writing a noir detective story really? set set in this science fiction universe. So it's real Sam Spade cynical you know, cynical kind of PI who's called in to solve a murder because, you know, the, the various AIs and the, 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 the machine learning can't handle it. So. See, I love it. And that is what I love is hearing some of that behind the scenes. Cause as you grab a copy and you start reading through and hearing that you're like, there's anticipation now. It's like, oh, I want to get to that part. That's that sounds great. And I guess as an author, that's some that's a joy that you can do is you can bake in some of those little, like you said, Easter eggs and little things, and uh, you know, 
you reach uh, our listener, our reader reaches out and says, Hey, I'm on chapter three. And you're like, Oh, wait till you get to chapter seven. Oh, wow. I'm so <laughs> excited for you. Uh, you got a lot to learn in the next couple chapters, but you can bake that stuff in there and kind mm-hmm. of delight and surprise your readers as you kind of craft this. I, I kind of like the idea that you can, you can do that insertion while you, while you write. That's, that sounds like fun to me. It It is. And it's, and it's, Again, it's stories that are based on things that happened in the novels. Um, trying to remember. It. Uh, let's see. Is it? Di- oh, yes. Yes. So in, in A Quiet Revolution, which is the third book in the Artemis War, Daniela Garcia who is a hotshot fighter pilot. There's a scene where she mentions that she's going to propose to her boyfriend. And now the scene veers off from there. uh, And it, you know, it goes into a bunch of other things. So I wrote that proposal as a story, which is in Into the Black. It's, uh, it has the longest title in there. On the, what is it? On the physics... Of rotating objects at the boundaries of gravitational fields. Yes. <laughs> wow. That is yes. long. Yeah. On the physics, yes. On the physics of rotating bodies at the boundaries of gravitational fields, which will make complete sense when you read the story. Um, but it's... It's this cute, fun little story, but it had no place in the novel. Hmm. It had absolutely no place in the novel because it would have derailed, you know, gone off on a sidetrack. So Into the Black is kind of like a best of mixtape of all your best little parts and pieces and compiled into one additional story that we can all follow along and we'll fill in the gaps through then, I guess, as we're reading the it's going it to yeah. fill in the gaps. Um, a, a couple of the stories in there have sequels in another collection. You know, just because the stories, the stories are fit. The stories stop, but they're not finished. If that makes sense. Okay. You know, there, there's a resolution at the end of the stories and I'm not going to tell you which stories they are, uh, <laughs> but there's a resolution but there is more to the story. And so I explore that in uh, the the next Tales from the Cassidy verse. Is it fun for you to come on a podcast or be interviewed and talk about your books and the stories and the, the world building and everything? Is this oh, absolutely. fun for I, you? I, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. No, it, you know, it, it's like what I said about, you know, writing a book. If I didn't enjoy talking about it, I wouldn't be here. Right. Um you know, I, I love getting on podcasts and, you know, going to conventions and talking to fans and, you know, you're going to local events and talking to people, you know, because this is a this is a different kind of science fiction. This is a different kind of writing that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of determination. There's a lot, you know, which you can find everywhere. There's a lot of snark, but there's also a lot of deeper questions that I slip in there and I want to leave the reader thinking at the end of it going, wait a second. Wait just a second. (laughs) (laughs) Let me process that for a second. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Yeah, exactly. Um, So Adam, talk more too, about what's coming down the road. You mentioned a few things you're working on. What's uh, coming up this year, 2024, for you and even beyond? What are your plans? So this year, I I have the Fantasy Trilogy coming out. Um, That's all lined up. Uh, First book is February 1st, and then second book, March 1st, and the third book is April 1st. Because I don't, you know, as, as a reader, I hate waiting for the next book in the series. Absolutely hate it. I understand, as an author... Yeah, but I hate waiting for it. So I held off releasing any of these books until I had all three of them ready to wow. go. 
That's good self-discipline right there. <laughs> um, I, I, other than that, I, I should have tracking Tantor done this year. Um, if, if things slow down in February, I may even get it done in the, in the next month, in which case I'll, you know, I'll have to get the cover put together and, you know, get everything lined up. But, but that's looking good. Uh, I just released, I, I just released the Terran Federation technical manual, which has a lot of, um, oh, it, it talks about the ships and the politics and, and throw in the playlist for the various, uh, for the various books. Um, all collected in one place because each book has, you know, the very, the appendices. Um, so that came out tracking Tantor should come out. Um, beyond that, uh, I'm, I've got a couple other irons in the fire at the moment. One is a, a comic prime caper novel uh, if if you know Donald Westlake and his Dortmunder novels, mm. then I, I want to capture some of that vibe. So that's going to be a contemporary. Uh, I have an idea for an urban fantasy that I'm fleshing out. Um, oh, what else? <laughs> there is definitely another book in the Cassidy verse centered around Kendra Cassidy. Um, there have been hints dropped in a few places as to the, the shape of it. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I don't know if I'll get to that one this year. It depends on, it depends on whether or not Kendra decides she wants to tell me about it. Um, and I'm going back and revising. So it's a science fiction memoir. Okay. It's Kendra's childhood. Mm. written by Kendra. So it's from her perspective, looking back at her youth and all the trouble she got into. Uh, so I wrote the original version a few years back and it was okay, but it could be better. So I'm making it better now. Good. I love it. Adam, like I, again, I would love to uh, take up rental space in your brain for a while and just try to figure out how you do all this because there's so many things I can learn just from your process alone <laughs> that would help me in my day to day. So uh, thank you for doing this. And again, for sending me a copy of the book. My wife and I will be scrapping it out tonight trying to figure out who's going to get their hands on it first. So, um, But as far as connecting with you, Adam, I have another question to end off the podcast. But before we go to that last question, what as far as where to find your books, where to find you, I'm, I'm anticipating there's people saying, man, I'd like to have Adam come and speak at my event or whatever. Uh, how do people get in touch with you? Where, where are you most active? Sure. So, you know, I'm, I'm a bit noble. Um, social media, it's very easy to find me. Just look for Adam Gaffin. You know, it's just, that's me on Facebook, Instagram, and threads. Um, and threads is a lot of fun for for authors and readers because there's, there's a good book threads community going on there uh, with a, a lot of support. So I, I strongly advise anybody who's a reader to get involved with threads and get into the book threads uh, connection. Uh, let's see. So Facebook and Instagram threads, you can find my website, which is CassidyChronicles.com. You can find all of the books there. You can find the blog where I feature weekly interviews with other authors. Um, you can, so you can buy the books there. You can even buy a little bit of merchandise from me because I have t-shirts now, which with the Dire Wolf Squadron logos on them. Nice. Um, and as for contacting me, uh, the two best emails you can either write to adamgaffinauthor at gmail.com or you can write to Kendra at castitychronicles.com. We can talk to, Ka to, to Kendra ourselves? That's amazing. Kendra sends out my newsletter. Oh, well, that's okay. nice. She helps you she, with that. Yes. Well, I mean, she, you know, she, she roped me into all this. So, <laughs> um, you know, she's, 
got to do something other than fill my head full of stories. Uh, and, and the newsletter only comes out every four weeks. She sends one every four weeks and I send one every four weeks. So it's every, you know, essentially every two weeks you get something, but you don't get anything else from me. So I don't, I don't spam my readers. It's nice to know that you and Kendra get along. That's a good thing. I like that. We have our moments. She's a little demanding sometimes. <laughs> okay. So with all of the things you've done as we close off, Adam, uh, one of the things I hear back from young authors listening to the show is they struggle with the idea of being rejected when their book is put in front of someone who will give them the thumbs up or the thumbs down, whether it goes through editing or whatever. They just, they fear being rejected. They want people to, they poured their whole heart into this book, their book, and mean so much to them. To have somebody sit across the desk and go, it's not ready, or it needs work, or whatever. Any tips for somebody, a young author, on dealing with rejection and how to power through that and keep moving forward? Absolutely. So an editor is on your side. That is, that's the first thing to remember, okay? The editor that you hire is on your side. They want your book to succeed, you know, I, I do freelance editing as well. I want your book to be as good as it possibly can be. And I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to suggest things to you that I think are going to make it better. And it's a process. If you disagree, if you say, no, taking this out is going to make it worse, and you can, and you can defend that, and you can show me how you know, taking it out is going to make it worse, I'm going to listen to you, you know, and say, oh, okay, I get it. Um, so that's the first thing. The editor is on your side. Uh, and as for readers not liking your book, I got a message from an ARC reader today saying that, um, sorry, she's not going to finish, you know, she's not going to finish the book that she's reading. Um, she's just not vibing with it. Okay. That's fine. My book is not, you know, my books are not for everybody. You know, I am not trying to go for the least common denominator. I want people to read my book who are going to enjoy it. As a new author, you want people who are going to read your book to enjoy. You know, you, you want the people who are going to enjoy your book to be the ones reading it. Um, and if they, if they leave a negative review somewhere and they say, oh, yeah, well, guess what? You know what a review says? A review says more about the reviewer than about the thing being reviewed. Mm. It, is, it is revealing them to everybody reading the review, not about the, not about the book or the movie or the you know, whatever it is that they're talking about. That's they're an amazing themselves. point. That's amazing, Adam. I've never heard anybody explain it that way. It makes so much sense. And it, and it dis disarms the comments, too. They're not as hurtful or impactful, realizing if you look at it through the lens you just shared. I like that. You know, and, and also as, a, as an author, you can take those one-star reviews and turn them into advertising gold. Yeah. You know, a, a friend of mine, uh, Rachel Renner, a lovely, lovely woman, writes amazing urban fantasies. Um, I, I, I love her books. Um, and it, it, it's fortunate that she and I get along so well because, you know, we turned into pretty good friends. But she got a one-star review, uh, and she turned it around and it is, and turned it into an ad because it, it was just, it was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant what she did. You know, it, it was highlighting and I don't want to give too much away about the book, it, but it was highlighting something that was in the book that this person didn't like, which most people probably would. So, okay, you know, go see what all the fuss is about. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen that for restaurants where they have a sign up front saying, come visit the place with the worst coffee ever, you know, <laughs> as rated right. by Adam and Dave, you know, it's like, Come try the worst coffee in the world. You know, it's like, that's pretty funny. I love how they just spin it around and, and use it to draw people in instead of pushing people away. So it's good. Yeah, it, and again, it's, it's, it's saying more about the reviewer than the thing being reviewed. Yeah, 
It's a good so. perspective. It's a great spot to, to end off too, Adam, on this. So I appreciate you doing this. And again, thank you. Thank you for the copy. I'm so happy to have it. So I will, like, like I mentioned, I'll take some pictures at the falls, send it to you. So you have a, your book has arrived and uh, we can promote the book there. And people at the falls, when I do that, they're all like, what are you doing? Taking pictures <laughs> of books at Niagara Falls. Very odd. But then I get to tell them about the podcast and I get to show them your book. So yeah. uh, that's really nice. So Adam, again, thank you so much for doing this. And I uh, would love to have you come back in the future. If you're interested, come back. Let's talk about more of your writings as they come out and celebrate your path as an author. Thank you for doing this and all of the great insight you shared with us today. It's awesome. Thanks for having me on today. I've had a lot of fun being here and I'd love to come back. <laughs> Thanks for being part of the podcast again. Appreciate you investing time in the show and you for listening this far. Thank you. One thing to keep in mind is we are looking for help and some support for the podcast. If you are able to help support our show, our little podcast show here, we can go over to livingthenextchapter.com and all the instructions will be there to help support the show. It takes about... 30 to $40 a month to do this just for the hosting and all of that other stuff that we pay for. But if the show is giving you any value and you're, and you're enjoying what's happening here, we'd love any kind of support that you can offer. That would be great. And you being here and sharing the show helps us grow, helps us get great new authors on the show, connect with other listeners and build community. So whatever you can do to share this show today, I really appreciate it. Thank you for being here on for living the next chapter, and I can't wait to share the next one with you. Talk soon. Have a great day. Hey there, fellow parent. If you're anything like me, balancing screen time for our kids is a constant struggle. That's why I want to share a little secret with you, Kids Pod. It's this amazing app I found that's packed with podcasts just for kids. Imagine stories, learning, and fun all without the screen. It's been a game changer in our house, keeping my kids engaged and their imaginations running wild. And guess what? It's completely free. So download Kids Pod today. Trust me, it's a decision you won't regret. 